Oh, hi there. You've seen them all. The Raimi trilogy, the Mark Webb duology, the Spider-Verse, and the MCU appearances. You diehards out there might have even seen the 77 TV series or the classic fan films. But there's one you probably haven't seen. And I say probably because there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who have seen this film. It's been screened since the 70s and as late as 2005. But what I'm about to show you is everything we have of the movie. And that's it. Four still images, all of which were probably taken behind the scenes, not included in the actual film. This is the story of that movie, the white whale of the Spider-Man fandom, one of the character's earliest live action appearances. This is the story of Spider-Man vs. Kraven the Hunter, the lost Spider-Man film. My bitter jungle power potion for the strength of 10 gorillas. Bruce Cardozo is a bit of an unsung hero of special effects in some classic movies, starting his professional career with uncredited optics work in Star Wars 5 and 6, and ending his career with more uncredited work in Thor, Captain America, and the Avengers while working for eFilm Digital Laboratories. Before becoming an industry professional, Bruce grew up reading Spider-Man comics in the 60s and saw the cinematic potential of the character. In his youth, he even shot experimental 8mm footage, trying in vain to do the character justice. I soon realized that to do the film correctly, it would take a gargantuan budget and a very carefully chosen cast. As he grew older, Bruce would continue to make low-budget superhero movies, some of which were screened at film festivals, even bagging him a handful of awards. In a bit of foreshadowing, all of these films that Bruce cut his teeth on are lost with the exception of the 1969 superhero film Voodoo Kid that only appeared online in 2016. Not only is this the sole film directed by Bruce Cardozo available to us, Bruce plays the movie's villain, giving us the only images of Bruce currently known to exist. His experience in amateur filmmaking led him to New York University, where in 1972, Bruce proposed to his film class an experimental Spider-Man movie. He laid out his plans for the film. It would be 30 minutes, live action, and comic accurate. He even detailed the special effects, and his classmates thought he was crazy. Superhero movies, even the ones with a decent budget, were terrible at the time. How could a student with no financial backing pull it off? And despite Bruce previously sharing this sentiment that he would need a gargantuan budget, his experience in the genre made him confident that he could make it a reality. Under the guidance of Professor Peter Glushna, the movie was greenlit, and Bruce decided to base his film on 1964's The Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 15. In this issue, Spider-Man is fighting a group of thugs, but one escapes, who turns out to be the villain Chameleon. Chameleon calls his half-brother, Kraven the Hunter, to defeat Spider-Man. After studying Spider-Man's movements, Kraven attacks, poisoning him. But in the end, Spider-Man defeats both Chameleon and Kraven. The comic actually ends with both villains being deported, something I don't imagine we're going to be seeing on the big screen anytime soon. This issue was notable for a few reasons. Issue number 15 marks the first appearance of Kraven the Hunter, one of the most overlooked villains in all of Spider-Man's rogues gallery, who is finally confirmed to make his live action debut. And it's also the first appearance of Anna Watson, who gives us the very first mention of her niece, Mary Jane Watson, though she won't appear until later issues. Obviously, the movie is not an official Marvel production, but the company wasn't as stingy with their characters like they are now under Disney. In October 1972, Cardozo wrote a letter to the legendary Stan Lee himself, explaining his Spider-Man project and asking for Lee's blessing. Stan Lee not only responded, but enthusiastically gave Bruce his blessing. The only catch? The movie was limited to a non-commercial release since Marvel Comics had existing licensing agreements to the character. But either way, Lee gave his stamp of approval and the movie was underway. During the making of the film, Cardozo was an absolute perfectionist. For the entire first term, the movie was in pre-production. And just so we're clear, all sources refer to the stages of the movie's development as terms. I thought this meant semesters originally, but based on the timeline of events, I think terms refers to years rather than semesters. During the lengthy pre-production phase, Bruce auditioned hundreds of amateur actors before deciding on the cast. In his own words, he wanted the audience to say he or she looks and acts exactly like the characters. But for the crew, his options were limited to fellow students and friends, bringing on Marilyn Hecht and Daphne Stevens as costume designers, who based their Spidey costume on the works of Steve Ditko. Richard Eberhardt worked on graphic design elements and performed stunt work as Spider-Man. Filming and editing was done by Julie Tanzer. Art Schweitzer was responsible for the movie's lighting, which Bruce referred to as experimental, and Bruce Cardozo himself, along with writing and directing, worked on the special effects. For these effects, his classmates were right to be skeptical. They involved building an entire wall laid on the floor to simulate Spider-Man's wall crawling. 
The team also used traveling matte shots, essentially an early form of combining two shots into the same scene before CGI and green screen were readily available, adding vibrant neon lights to the wall crawling shots. These matte shots would also be used to simulate Spider-Man swinging across New York and were used for the final battle where Kraven unleashes tigers on Spider-Man. As you might have noticed, in the original comics there are no tigers, so this is a good time to mention that despite Bruce insisting the movie be comic accurate, he took a number of creative liberties. Along with adding the lions, he added Gwen Stacy, who hadn't shown up in the comics by issue number 15, and additional scenes fleshing out Craven's arrival to New York that weren't shown in the comics. But because the film is lost, we don't know how else it might have deviated from the source material. For example, there's no indication that Chameleon is in the movie, which would completely change the movie's setup from the comic. After the first term, when pre-production was complete, Cardozo had finally decided on the cast. For the lead, Spider-Man was played by Joe Ellison, and J. Jonah Jameson was played by Andrew Pastorio. These two are perfectly cast for their roles, but they are the only two actors we know of. We actually know more of the crew members than the people who acted in the movie. We don't know who played Gwen Stacy, potentially Chameleon, and we don't even know who played the titular Kraven the Hunter in his very first live action portrayal. During filming, the movie attracted some mild hype and was given a write-up in the December 1973 issue of Foom, Marvel's self-published fan magazine. To this day, this article is one of the only known pieces of documentation for the movie, containing its only known photos, all of which are black and white even though the movie was in color. By August 74, when the movie was about three quarters of the way finished, they sent a few scenes to Stan Lee and the crew at Marvel. And they were impressed, particularly by the casting, pushing the team to finish the movie. Sometime in 1974, Spider-Man vs. Kraven the Hunter was complete. As Bruce said in the Foom article, he and the crew hoped their movie would be able to be distributed in some form, but this would never happen. Even though there's no confirmation of this, I would guess the first screening took place at the film school. But the first confirmed public viewing of Spider-Man vs. Kraven was at Marvel's second annual comic convention in 1976, held in New York City. Since the 1976 screening, it's reported that the movie was shown at other conventions, but there is only one other confirmed public viewing that I could find, which would also be its last. Spider-Man vs. Kraven the Hunter was shown to the public for its final time at the 2005 comic book and science fiction convention in Los Angeles. With the advent of the internet, fans begged Bruce to upload the movie online, but he refused. Based on all available sources, there are four possible copies of the film. The scenes that were sent to Stan Lee and Marvel that they probably didn't keep a hold of. The footage shown at the 1976 Marvel convention. The copy shown at the 2005 comic book and sci-fi convention. This could be the same copy from 76, but at this point it could have been a digitized copy. And a copy known to be on Bruce's personal computer. In 2015, Bruce Cardozo passed away. The movie would never be released, and since his death, it's believed that his personal computer containing the movie was thrown away. In his lifetime, Cardozo was adamant that the film never be released online, only privately screened. There are some conflicting reasons as to why Bruce never wanted the movie to be seen by a wider audience. There's an unsourced claim that Bruce doesn't want to show the forces at Marvel and Sony how to make a good Spider-Man film, but this is ridiculous and sounds out of character. The most reasonable explanation is that he's embarrassed by the film. He made it in his 20s as a school project with no budget. The movie's probably a mess. Despite the director's wishes, Spider-Man vs. Kraven the Hunter has become the holy grail of the Spider-Man fandom. But there are a number of factors that make the search for this lost film exceedingly difficult. One of the most frustrating parts about the search is for most of the cast and crew, this is their only film credit. Spider-Man actor Joe Ellison, who would likely be in his 60s or 70s by this point, has no other acting roles. He could potentially be director and writer Joseph Ellison, best known for his film Don't Go in the House, but I can't find any way to contact him, or if he's even still alive. Costumer Marilyn Hecht doesn't appear to have worked on any other projects, unless her name is misspelt and she's producer-director Marlon Hecht. J. Jonah Jameson actor Andrew Pastorio only worked on one other film, 1978's Fingers, playing Elderly Driver. Since he was playing elderly characters in the 70s, about 50 years later, he's almost certainly passed. And this brings up another complication with the search. Even though most of the crew were film students in their 20s, most are probably in their 70s and retired by now. Lighting expert Art Schweitzer, also known as Arthur, is last credited for a film in the early 90s. Costume designer Daphne Stevens worked until 2002. Editor Julie Tanzer worked until the late 90s. The only member of the crew that still might be working is graphic designer and Spider-Man stunt actor Richard Eberhardt. His last credit, according to IMDb, is as cinematographer and producer in 2016's The Lost City of Cecil B. DeMille, which is actually Bruce's last film credit too, being released after his death. But for each of the cast and crew, I cannot find a single contact. 
no email, no phone number, manager, or social media presence of any kind. And even if I could contact them, because of how closely guarded the film was, they probably don't even have a copy. I've spent the last couple of weeks scouring the internet for anyone to contact, anyone who might have a new lead on the film. I was able to connect with Tom Caggiano, who uploaded Bruce's only available film, Voodoo Kid. He was actually kind enough to provide me with another photo of Bruce, the only image outside his performance of Voodoo Kid that we have. But unfortunately, he had no new leads on the lost film. And at this point, I've exhausted all my resources. But I almost certainly missed something. The Lost Media community has pulled off some amazing feats, and this is one I would love to see them work their magic on. But we also might need to accept the possibility that Bruce Cardozo's Spider-Man vs. Kraven the Hunter is lost forever. But I'm not ready to give up so easily. Thank you so much for watching. There are some other really great pieces of Spider-Man Lost Media, so let me know if you want me to cover them, or if there's any other pieces of Lost Media in general you want to see more of. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.